Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our topic this evening is capitalism versus socialism, which is the moral system. To answer, we have to know what is morality. What is the ethical standard we're going to use to judge a political system? We cannot just assume that everyone knows or it's in the Bible. We've got to state and validate our moral views at the outset because that's what's going to decide this debate. Now, our side holds that the standard of morality is man's life, that which man requires in order to sustain his life. Whatever man requires by his nature in order to survive, we regard as the good or the moral. Man's crucial tool of survival is his reason, his mind. The mind is our only means of dealing with reality, grasping facts, acquiring reliable knowledge. The mind is the basic source of every pro-life value. Take as one example the immense, unprecedented wealth that you see all around you in the West, the wealth created since the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. This wealth was not produced by muscles, but essentially by thought, the thought of the scientists who discovered new knowledge, of the inventors who used the knowledge to create new products, of the businessmen who used their minds to conceive and organize large-scale productive enterprises. Physical labor by itself is not what creates wealth. Every earlier age had an abundance of physical labor. What creates wealth and all human values is thought. That's point one. Morality means thinking, reasoning, exercising, and living by one's mind. Point two. Life requires selfishness. A living organism has to be the beneficiary of its own actions. It has to pursue specific objects for itself, for its own sake and survival. Life requires the gaining of values, not their loss. Achievement, not renunciation. Self-preservation, which is selfish, not self-sacrifice. If life is the standard, then morality cannot consist of sacrifice. Sacrifice is incompatible with the requirements of human life. And I mean here any kind of sacrifice, whether of oneself to others or of others to oneself. Many people think our choice is only sacrifice yourself to others, which they call altruism, or sacrifice others to yourself, which they call selfishness. Cut your own throat for your neighbor's sake or cut their throats for your own sake. Either way, however, one thing remains the same. Somebody's throat gets cut and the dispute is merely over who is to be the victim. If life is the standard, however, we should not be reduced to haggling over victims. We should oppose on principle the idea of throat cutting, in other words, of sacrifice. A selfish man, in the sense I advocate, does not sacrifice others to himself. Selfishness means each man is an end in himself, neither sacrificing himself to others nor others to himself. A man should live independently, by his own mind and effort with no victims. Such a man uses his mind to the fullest and acts accordingly. In other words, I'm talking about rational self-interest. And in dealing with others, this means trading value for value by mutual consent to mutual advantage. It means each party respecting the sovereignty and the freedom of the others with no sacrifice either way. The ethics of social service the ethics of self-sacrifice is what is destroying the world today. Who is supposed to sacrifice and to whom according to the conventional theories that we hear everywhere? Are the incompetent supposed to sacrifice to the able? The parasites to the productive? Obviously, no. The able and productive have nothing to gain from such a sacrifice. It's supposed to work in reverse, we're told. The able are to sacrifice to the incompetent, the productive to the parasites, the thinkers to the mindless, the healthy to the afflicted. In other words, the common denominator is the, the successful at living are to be penalized because they are successful in the name of rewarding the failures who get rewarded because they are failures. You could not invent a more anti-life code of morality and the only practical effect it can have is to strike down all who succeed at life and thereby drag down the whole human race, as you now see happening all over the world. 
properly if you are in trouble through no fault of your own. And I stress that this has to be a marginal issue. If everyone was in such trouble, the human race couldn't exist. If you are in such trouble, you have to depend on the voluntary generosity and private charity of those who are not in trouble. You have to ask for help as a favor, not as a right. You cannot use your trouble as a club over your neighbor's head. You have to recognize that other men have a right to exist too, that your suffering does not make them your slave. In other words, this is not the function of the government. What is? Well, Dr. Ridpath will be covering this point, but in essence, we hold the government's function is to protect each individual precisely from being sacrificed by others or to others, to protect the independence of each man's mind, in other words, to protect his individual rights and leave every man free to act on his own judgment and for his own profit. And this is exactly what capitalism is. And I want to stress this, capitalism is not what we have in the West today. I'm talking about less safe, fair capitalism. In other words, the complete separation of state and economics. Not government by pressure groups, not government favors for any group, whether businessmen, labor, farmers, or consumers. Not tariff protection, nor subsidies, nor franchises, nor any kind of handouts or welfare functions. I'm speaking of government as an impartial arbiter to prevent citizens from violating individual rights and otherwise hands off, which is what laissez-faire means. Capitalism is the system that leaves man free to function. It leaves each individual free to live by his own mind and judgment, pursue his own goals, trade voluntarily with others. It's the system based on the morality of rational self-interest. Socialism is the opposite. However socialists may protest that the individual will benefit under their system, the fact remains socialists claim that the standard of value is not the life of the individual but the welfare of the group, whether they call it the collective, the community, the race, the nation, the proletariat. They hold that it's the duty of the individual to serve the group, to sacrifice for others, as decreed by the group's representative and spokesman, the all-powerful state. This viewpoint must mean ultimately the enslaving of the individual by the state and therefore the crushing of thought, production, achievement, and finally of life itself. In the 19th century, when the West came closest to capitalism, the result was the highest standard of living and the longest interval of peace in mankind's history. The moral is the practical. As for socialism, look at the collapse of England, look at Soviet Russia, and remember that Nazi Germany meant National Socialist Germany. The results of socialism everywhere, uh, am I out of time? Yes, you are. Are as bad as they could have been predicted. Thank you.